um, in science, obtaining the same result through different means is often seen as a valid way to further confirm a hypothesis. So the Bayesian should, of course, have something to say about the logic underpinning this method of confirmation. But as Schubach has um, persuasively argues, Bayesian accounts of robustness analysis, which rely on probabilistic independence to explicate the notion of, ev of evidence diversity, are in many cases inadequate. Um, Given this, it seems evident that in order to capture these cases, uh, we must depart from independence-based accounts of evidence diversity. Schubach's recent um, explanatory account of robustness analysis has, in my view, been rightly welcomed as a promising step in the right direction. Indeed, by have, having as its central notions explanation and elimination, this account seems to fit very nicely with many um, empirically driven cases of robustness analysis in science, while at the same time providing important, important normative implications. Schubach also suggests that, uh, however, that his account applies to model-based robustness analysis just as well as it does to empirically driven cases of robustness analysis. And he's not alone uh, to claim this. Uh, Winsberg, for instance, has also recently argued that Schubach's explanatory account of robustness analysis can be successfully applied to the context of climate models. And um, many seems to agree with um, Wittsburg's claim. However, although suggestion seems to be gaining popularity amongst philosophers, I don't think that anyone, including Schubach, has rigorously shown how this account uh, is supposed to work in the context of models. And indeed, in this talk, I will argue that the application of Schubach's account to model-based robust analysis is considerably more complicated than he and others, such as Winsberg, suggest, and relies on several non-trivial and often dubious assumptions. By making these assumptions explicit, I will show that Schubach's explanatory account of robust analysis is inapplicable to many cases of model-based robust analysis, contrary to what has been assumed in the literature. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I will First, um, introduce Schubach's explanatory account of robustness analysis. I will then give a quick example of an empirically driven case of robustness analysis to illustrate how Schubach's account can be successfully <clears throat> applied to this case. And I will then assess whether Schubach's account is applicable to a very different example of robustness analysis in the context of climate model ensembles. I will conclude that it is not. Uh, the example I will use is one that Winsberg himself has relied on to argue that Schubach's account can shed light on the epistemic input of model-based robustness analysis in climate science. And I choose to focus on this example for two reasons. First, I think it provides a useful lesson to keep in mind when attempting to apply Bayesian accounts to justify the epistemic input of model-based robustness analysis. If we choose to do so, then we better make the assumptions on which these accounts rely explicit as to adequately defend them. Second, the discussion around the epistemic input of robustness analysis in climate science has been, and still is, a very live one, both in the philosophical and climate literature. Hence, if we want to help move this debate forward, we philosophers should, to the best of our abilities, distinguish sound arguments for the epistemic input of modern robustness in climate science from those that are not sound. As I believe Wisbeth's argument is not sound, it is important for me to show why. Nonetheless, by demonstrating that Schubach's account fails to apply to this example, I also aim to show that this account is, not, is inapplicable to a very large class of model-based robustness analysis. That is, all cases in which the hypothesis that we want to confirm is that a result of the model is instantiated in the target system, and the models we select for robustness analysis involve incompatible assumptions about that system. OK, so according to Schubach, when there is more than one means of detecting a result R, the notion of diversity that is relevant to robustness analysis is what he calls array diversity. So means of detecting a result are, are array diverse with respect to potential explanation H and its competitors to the extent that their detections can be put into a sequence for which any member is explanatorily discriminating between H and some competing explanations not yet ruled out by the prior members of that sequence. Now, of course, this account of array diversity would be too vague to count as a Bayesian account of robustness analysis. However, by relying on a probabilistic conception of explanatory power, Schubach attempts to provide a more rigorous account of robustness analysis of array diversity. So according to Schubach, the explanatory power that um, an explanation H has over its explanandum E is given by the following 
formula where epsilon can take values ranging from minus one to one. Um, it can also be easily shown that if the probability of E given H is approximately one, then the explanatory power that H has over E uh, will be approximately one, as long as the probability of E is not approximately one. This will come in handy later on. Um, so the idea behind this measure of explanatory power is that the greater the value of epsilon, the more powerful the explanation H of E. But note that Schubach and Sprenger carefully pointing at Sprenger, Schubach and Sprenger come up with this um, um, formula for the expanded power of, they defend this formula and there's many in the literature. But one, one thing that they point out is that this holistic measure of expanded power is not intended to reveal the condition under which a theory is explanatory of some proposition. Rather its goal um, is to reveal for any theory already known to provide such an explanation, just how strong that explanation is. Now, although there is certainly plenty to say about this probabilistic measure of explanatory power, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm happy to assume that this measure does a good job at capturing the explanatory power that an explanation has over its explanandum. So similarly, um, the explanatory power that an explanation H has over its explanandum E in light of some proposition P um, is given by the following equation. Pretty similar, just uh, conditionalized on P. Um, so equipped with this um, probabilistic conception of explanatory power, Schubach provides the following five formal conditions for a successful increment of IRA diversity. So according to the past detection condition, uh, a result R has been detected using n minus one different means. So formally we're given E. According to the success condition, the target hypothesis H explains this coincidence, but so does another rival hypothesis H prime. And formally this is captured by saying that the explanatory power that H has over E and the explanatory power that H prime has over E is greater than zero. Um, the, according to the competition condition, H and H prime epistemically can compete with one another. And this can happen for two reasons. Either H and H prime are mutually ex exclusive, case one, or um, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but H prime suffices to do the ex explanatory work of H. Um, and so this is captured, so this is case two and it's captured formally by saying that the explanatory power that H has over E in light of H prime is less or equal to zero. Uh, according to the discrimination condition, um, there is another nth means of potentially detecting result R such that in light of E, H would strongly explain the detecting of R by this means, and H prime would strongly explain not detecting R by this means. And formally, this is captured by saying that the explanatory power that H has over Rn in light of E is approximately one, whereas the explanatory power that H prime has over not Rn in light of E is approximately one. And finally, the new detection condition says we learn Rn. So the nth means also detects result R. So as a final treat, Schubach shows that the above formal conditions, if satisfied, guarantee an incremental confirmation of the target hypothesis H. Um, so in light of the above formal conditions, not only it is clear what Schubach's notion of IRA diversity actually consists in, but also why this notion is epistemically important from a vision perspective. Evidence that is IRA diverse with respect to a target hypothesis H and its competitors should rationally increase our degrees of belief in the target hypothesis. It is also worth mentioning that when H and H prime are mutually exclusive hypotheses, the extent uh, to which H is confirmed uh, is determined by how plausible the competing hypothesis H prime was, and also how well that competitor fit the evidence pre-elimination. Um, notice further that um, neither the success condition nor the discrimination condition can be satisfied if either the probability of H is equal is approximately zero or the probability of H prime is approximately zero. So if an agent has no confidence in either H or H prime, um, there cannot be any successful increment of IRA diversity. 
Now, this is a rather trivial fact, but it will nonetheless be an important one for what I will argue later on in this talk, hence why I wanted to uh, stress it now. Okay, so what should we think? Um, what should we make of the above area of conditions? Are they intuitive? Do they fit nicely with actual cases of robust analysis in science? As far as empirically driven cases of robust analysis are concerned, Schubach's conditions do seem intuitively appealing in many cases. To motivate the intuition behind this condition, Schubach considers the case of the then curious motion of a sample of pollen granules suspended in water, first observed in 1827 by the botanist Robert Brown. So when Einstein offered this, his molecular explanation for this motion in the early 20th century, the fact that this motion had been detected by a multitude of other different experiments using different materials, different media, different means of suspending the particles, et cetera, um, was considered as evidence in favor of his explanation. But why should the fact that this motion has been detected by various different means count as evidence for Einstein's molecular explanation? According to Schubert, this is because the various means of detecting the Brownian motion are already diverse with respect to Einstein's molecular explanation and its competitors. And this indeed seems plausible. When, for, when, Bra when Brown first observed the curious motion of the pollen granules suspending water, there were more than a few competing explanations for this uh, observed phenomenon. Um, the motion might have been due to currents or evaporation of the water, or it might have been due to a sexual drive in having pollen, etc. But there were many late detections of this motion that were able to explain to discriminate between Einstein's molecular explanation H and one of the many competing explanations not yet ruled out. Take, for instance, uh, the competing explanation H prime, that the motion was due to a sexual drive inherent in pollen, and consider a new detection of this motion using an inorganic material. Does this new detection plausibly satisfy all of the five conditions for a successful increment of irate of asking? Let us go through each of them very quickly. Um, so in this example, the brown motion has already been detected using a sample of pollen. Uh, yeah, using a sample of pollen granules suspended in water. So we have E. Um, so pass detection is, is, is satisfied. Furthermore, I says like explanation H and the sexual driving area and pollen explanation H prime provide different causal explanations for the observed motion at once. So it seems reasonable to assume that both H and H prime increase the probability that one should observe this motion. Um, but then it is also reasonable to assume that the explanatory power that H has over R1 is greater than zero, and the explanatory power that H prime has over R1 is greater than zero. Hence, uh, so both H and H prime closely satisfy the success, success condition. Now, the competition condition is also plausible. Oh, I had actually little. Um, it's also plausible. Um, um, for although H and H prime are not mutually exclusive hypotheses, H prime is sufficient for doing the explanatory work of H. So that was case two in the conditions. It also seems uh, plausible to assume that, oh, let me put the, <laughs> um, it also seems plausible to assume that in light of the um, detection of this motion using a sample of pollen granules, R1, H would strongly explain the detection of this motion using an organic material, whereas H prime would strongly explain not detecting this motion by this means. So not R2 in accordance with the discrimination condition. Why is that? So H cites causes of the observed motion that would also cause the movement of inorganic material was H prime cites causes that would not cause such movement. Hence, it seems plausible to assume that whereas H makes it extremely likely that we would observe this motion using an organic material, H prime makes it extremely likely that we would not observe it. And this does imply that the explanatory power that H has over R2 in light of R1 is approximately one, and the explanatory power that H prime has over not R2 in light of R1 is approximately one. And so the discrimination condition is satisfied. And finally, we learn brand emotion has been detected using an organic material, so we learn R2, and hence the new detection condition is also satisfied. So all conditions of irate diversity seem to be reasonably satisfied in this example. And a similar story could actually be told for various other means that were used to detect brown motion. So I'm happy to be enticed by Schubach 
into concluding that the reasons why the robustness of granular emotion across various different means both was and should have counted as evidence for Einstein's molecular explanation is that the various detections could be put into a sequence for which any member was explanatory discriminating between Einstein's molecular explanation H and some competing explanations not yet ruled out by the prime members of that sequence, and that therefore each detection in the sequence was able to incrementally confirm H. Now, admittedly, I have not tried hard to convince you that Schubach's account of array diversity can be successfully applied uh, to all empirically driven cases of robustness analysis. And as a matter of fact, I don't actually think uh, this is the case. But what matters for this talk is that Schubach's account of array diversity does seem to fit very nicely with some empirically driven cases of robustness analysis. And in particular, what allows us to apply Schubach's account in this case is the fact that it was possible to find an adequate target and rival explanation for the detection of granular motion that satisfied all of Schubach's conditions of array diversity. Now, as mentioned earlier, Schubach claims that his account of area diversity applies to model-based robustness analysis just as well as it does to empirically driven cases of robustness analysis. But I will now try to show that when it comes to model-based robustness analysis, um, the picture is rather more complicated than what he suggests. In particular, I will attempt to apply Schubach's account of area diversity to a very different example of robustness analysis in the context of climate model ensembles, one on which Winsberg has relied to also argue that Schubert's account can finally shed light on the epistemic input of model-based robustness analysis in climate science. However, I will conclude, contrary to Wiesberg, that Schubert's account does not apply to this example. So there is, so let's start. Okay, so there is a substantial difference between empirically driven cases of robustness analysis and model-based robustness analysis. And it is important to make this difference clear before we can attempt to apply Schubert's account of array diversity uh, to the latter. So we call that Schubert's account of array diversity concerns distinct means of detecting the same result R. Um, Schubert has shown if those distinct means of detecting result R are array diverse with respect to a target explanation H and its rival explanations for the detections, then H is incrementally confirmed. In the empirically driven case of robustness analysis just discussed, R and its detections all concern the actual world and the hypothesis that we want to confirm that is Einstein's molecular explanation, which also concerns the actual world, is a possible explanation for these detections. In the case of model-based robustness analysis, however, things are less straightforward, since in this case, R and its detections, um, R1, R2, et cetera, all concern model land, but the hypothesis that we want to confirm, that is the hypothesis that R is instantiated in the target system, concerns the actual world. And hence, it is not a possible explanation for these detections. Um, hence, a crucial difference between empirically driven cases of robustness analysis and model-based robustness analysis is the following. In the former, the hypothesis that we want to confirm is a possible explanation for why we detect the same result, whereas in the latter, it is not a possible explanation for why we detect the same result. So in light of this difference, it's clear that the application of Schubert's account of array diversity to model-based robustness analysis is considerably less straightforward. This does not imply that Schubach's account is not applicable to model-based robustness analysis, but it does nonetheless show that any attempt to successfully apply will have to acknowledge this difference and show that it can be applied in spite of it. I will now attempt to do just this. So to assess how Schubach's um, account um, of array diversity can apply to model-based robust analysis. It would be helpful to consider a very simple and abstract example of model robustness analysis first. Suppose I've learned that a model gives a particular result. So I've learned a, a one. And suppose further that I subsequently learned that another model in which an isolation assumption A1 of the original model has been replaced by another utilization assumption A2 also gives the same result. I learned R2. So are these two detections of our are of us with respect to a target and rival hypothesis. Or in other words, can Schubert's account of array diversity show that learning R2 should incrementally confirm the hypothesis that R is instantiated in the target system? For this to be the case, we must find an adequate target hypothesis H and rival hypothesis H prime. So let's think first about a plausible candidate for H. Of course, the hypothesis that we ultimately want to confirm is that, is that R is instantiated in the target system. 
But as mentioned earlier, this hypothesis cannot be an adequate target hypothesis since it is not a possible explanation for why we detect R in model land. Indeed, recall that the success condition demands that the explanatory power that H has over R1 is greater than zero, and the discrimination condition demands that uh, the explanatory power that H has over R2 in light of R1 is approximately one. But if we take H to be the hypothesis that R is instantiated in the target system, neither condition is satisfied. Since this hypothesis alone, without any further assumption about the ability of the model to adequately represent the target system, doesn't make it any more or less likely that the two models in question will have property R. And hence, um, both the expanded power that H has over R1 and the expanded power that H has over R2 in light of R1 will be equal to zero. So in that share, I believe uh, that to satisfy both conditions, the target hypothesis H must assert something like the following. R is instantiated in the target system and both models adequately represent the target system. Now, I choose to use the word adequate here rather than accurate for a reason. Uh, as Parker and many have, others have argued, most scientific models are never accurate representations of the target system. And hence the hypothesis that a model is an accurate representation of the target system is often not the sort of hypothesis that can be confirmed. Um, according to Parker, however, what can sometimes be confirmed is instead the adequacy of a model for a particular purpose. Under this view, what we want to and maybe can confirm is the hypothesis that a model, despite not being an accurate representation, is nonetheless an adequate representation for a particular purpose at hand. So following Parker's suggestion, then the claim that both models uh, adequately represent the target system in my target hypothesis H is meant to capture the idea that the models are adequate for the particular purpose at hand, in this case, that of discerning whether or not R is instantiated in the target system. Notice that if H is true and hence R is instantiated in the target system and both models adequately represent the target system, then both models must have property R, that is the probability of um, R1 given H is equal to one, and also the probability that R2 given uh, R1 and H is equal to one. And this implies that the success condition and the discrimination conditions are satisfied. So, have we found a plausible candidate for the target hypothesis? Um, perhaps, but of course, only if we think that it is plausible that both models can indeed be adequate representation of the target system in the case in question. But crucially, an important caveat um, is in order. For H to be a plausible candidate for the target hypothesis, we must think um, that both models are adequate representations, not by mere luck, but because for whatever reasons, the model lacked the models latch on to the underlying mechanism um, in the target system. For if we do think that the models are adequate simply as a matter of luck, then according to us, H is an arbitrary conjunction. That is, the hypothesis that R is instantiated in the target system and the hypothesis that the models have property R, and hence they're adequate, are unrelated to one another. But if H is an arbitrary conjunction, then the hypothesis that R is instantiated in the target system is irrelevant to the behavior of the models, and hence it is not part of an explanation of the model's results. However, one might wonder in virtue of what does the model latch on to the underlying mechanism? Um, although an answer to this question is beyond the scope of this talk, I do believe that any such answer will have to necessarily depend on the nature of the hypothesis we want to confirm. Um, okay, let's we may have found a plausible candidate for the target hypothesis H. Um, what about a plausible candidate for the rival hypothesis H prime? Now, I believe the only possible candidate for a rival explanation H prime is the following logical hypothesis. Uh, the model entails R1, and if A1 is replaced with a different assumption A2, the new model entails not R2. Uh, the target hypothesis H and the rival hypothesis H prime are mutually exclusive since H prime entails R1 and not R2, whereas H entails R1 and R2, hence the competition condition is satisfied. Uh, the fact that H prime entails both R1 and, R and not R2 means that it also satisfies the success condition and the discrimination condition. Hence, since H prime satisfies all conditions of um, RA diversity, whether H prime is a possible candidate for a rival potential explanation will ultimately depend on whether or not we think that logical hypothesis can be explanatory in the first place. And as mentioned earlier, 
uh, epsilon is not supposed to reveal whether a theory is explanatory of some proposition. But indeed, one may wonder whether uh, a non-logical alternative rival explanation H prime could be found instead. For instance, uh, one may suggest the following alternative for H prime. Uh, R is not instantiated in the target system and the original model is inadequate and the new model is adequate. However, I have at least two concerns about this alternative rival explanation. Uh, first, um, it is unclear why the hypothesis that R is instantiated in the target system and that the original model is inadequate can be thought of as an explanation for why the original model gives R. In other words, why should the fact that a model is inadequate explain a particular result of the model? Worryingly, if that were right, what would stop us from formulating a target hypothesis which states that R is not instantiated in the target system and both models are inadequate? This would clearly be bad news. Second, whether or not R is instantiated in the target system is irrelevant for coming up with a rival explanation to my target hypothesis. According to my target hypothesis, both models must have property R since they're both adequate and R is instantiated in the target system. Hence, if the second model fails to have property R, then the target hypothesis is rejected independently for, of whether R is instantiated in the target system. Hence, given that the hypothesis that R is not instantiated in the system is irrelevant for rejecting the target hypothesis, it is not clear why it should be part of a rival explanation. Okay. Um, oh, um, so if logical hypothesis are explanatory, then we may have found both a target and rival explanation that satisfy all of Schubert's condition of IRA diversity. And hence, uh, detections R1 and R2 could potentially count as IRA diverse in this case. However, notice that uh, a logically omniscient agent will either have degrees of belief, um, so will either think that, believe that the probability of H prime is one or the probability of H prime is zero, depending on whether H prime is true or false respectively. And since H and H prime are mutually exclusive, this means that for such agent, either the probability of H is equal to zero, the probability of H prime is equal to zero and hence, detections R1 and R2 cannot count as array diverse for that agent. So, so only for an agent who's not logically omniscient for whom the probability of H prime can take no maximum values could detections R1 and R2 count as array diverse. Okay, so I will now turn to a less abstract example of model-based robustness analysis in the context of climate models. So um, there is a, great deal of uncertainty about how to adequately uh, represent the climate system. And due to this uncertainty, it's often impossible to choose which model out of the available ones future climate change projections uh, should rely. Hence, current projections of future climate change very often rely on more than a single model. And uh, the most recent couple model in comparison projection phase six, for instance, is a huge collaborative effort involving about 50 climate modeling groups from uh, around the world to promote a standard set of model simulations, whose outputs are then analyzed by the IPCC authors to produce many of their findings. As Parker remarks, um, although it is not at all clear how one should interpret multi-model ensemble results, the intuition persists that agreement among ensemble members, members about the extent of future climate change warrants increased confidence in the projected changes. Winsberg has emphatically argued that Schubach's account of IRA diversity can shed light on the epistemic input of model-based robustness analysis in climate science and hence reveal when, why and when this intuition is right. And it's not alone. According to uh, Ologlin, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry. Um, so according to him, um, Winsberg con convincingly argues that Schubach's account can be applied to climate models. In reviews of Winsberg's book, Lask writes that Winsberg's argument is a convincing reconceptualization of robustness analysis in climate science. And Knussel <laughs> writes that Winsberg makes um, a novel convincing suggestion from multiple sources of evidence in favor of a, of a hypothesis are meaningful in climate science. However, as mentioned earlier, I would not argue that this is not the case, but first it would be useful to look at one of the main sources of uncertainty in climate modeling, uh, the parameterization of physical processes. Um, so several physical processes whose representations 
is thought to be critical in generating accurate projections cannot be resolved directly by current climate models since they occur at a much smaller scale than the model's grid resolution. For instance, uh, the development of and evolution of cloud processes are thought to play a very important role in the Earth's radiation budget. However, these processes cannot be resolved directly by current climate models, since clouds can be as diminutive as a few hundred meters across, essentially smaller than the current um, model's grid resolution. Therefore, in order to include uh, the effects of these subgrid processes in the evolution um, in the evolution of the model variables, um, the subgrid processes must be represented in terms of larger scale variables. This process of representing physical processes that cannot be di resolved directly by the model is known as parameterization. And since the parameterized subgrid process is one for which the model has no direct information, the subgrid processes must be related to known model model variables in one way or another. Hence, the process of parameterization involves both a choice of what equations to describe the various relationships between the subgrid processes um, and the known model variables, and a choice of the various parameter values within those equations. So it is clear then that when it comes to the parameterization of subgrid processes, there will always be at least two sources of uncertainty. One is parameter uncertainty, that is uncertain concerning the adequate parameter values, and the other is structural uncertainty, uh, uncertainty concerning the adequate equations describing the relationships between the subgrid process and known model variables. However, it is important to note that regardless of these choices, uh, parameterizations by necessity distill only the essential aspects of the physical processes they represent. So in other words, all parameterizations are invariably simplified and idealized representations of complex physical processes. With all this in mind, um, let us now look at an example on which Wisberg relies to convince us that Schubach's account or can shed light on the epistemic input of model-based robust analysis in climate science. Here's what he writes. Suppose that a climate simulation can be used to calculate that equilibrium climate sensitivity is greater than two degrees Celsius. One explanation of this is that um, equilibrium climate sensitivity is actually greater than two degrees Celsius. Uh, thus, this would count as a detection of the hypothesis uh, that equilibrium climate sensitivity is greater than two degrees Celsius by a model. But another possible explanation might be that the calculated result is an artifact of the large grid size of the simulation. A natural move is to try to half, half the grid size and check to see if the result is maintained. If it is, half the grid size again. If the result remains stable, then the probability of that rival explanation goes way down. Thus, a reasonable ensemble of different simulation models with descending grid size could count as array diverse. But even once we're convinced that the grid size is not responsible for the purported detection of the hypothesis, there remains the possibility that detection is an artifact of the way that cloud formation is parameterized in the simulation. A rival cloud parameterization can be tried. Certainly, those two methods of detection would count as array diverse. Again, context of judgment, but this time presumably of a more subtle and difficult character would be required to decide at what point, if any, enough different cloud parameterization schemes are enough to rule out all such hypotheses. So Winsberg here is using two examples to illustrate when simulations uh, results would count as array diverse. The first concerns simulation with different grid sizes, um, and the second concerns simulation with different parameterizations. However, the example, the first example is in my view, besides the point when it comes to discussions concerning the epistemic input of model-based robust analysis, scientists are very well aware that higher resolution would, for instance, uh, reduce the influence of physical parameterizations of some of the processes that are sufficiently well understood, but that occur at a finer spatial and temporal scale. So if they could increase the solution, they would. But substantially increasing model resolution for global climate models is not at all trivial and requires an enormous amount of computing powers. Hence, for the time being, the resolution of current global climate models is what it is, and climate scientists have to live with it. The question that matters to us is whether current global climate models can be used to learn about the climate. In particular, in this case, what we want to know is whether the fact that a result is robust across current multimodal ensembles should increase our confidence in that result. 
Given that those models often include distinct parameterization, so the same physical process, Winsberg's second example seems more pertinent to this question. So in this example, Winsberg considers simulation involving a particular parameterization scheme for cloud formation. So a particular structural assumption B1, which gives result R1, that um, equilibrium climate sensitivity is greater than two. Um, he then claims that if one were to observe that a second simulation involving a rival cloud parameterization scheme, that is a different structure assumption B2, gives the same result, R2, uh, these two detections would count as array diverse. Hence, Winsberg is implicitly assuming that it is possible to find a target explanation H and rival explanation H prime that satisfy Schubach's condition of array diversity in this case. Now, the following candidates for H and H prime is prima facie seem reasonable. Um, so, R is instantiated in the target system, and both climate simulations are adequate representation of the target system. And then my logical rival hypothesis, uh, the original climate simulation entails R1, and if B1 is replaced with B2, the new simulation entails not R2. However, I will argue that due to the incompatibility of the assumption B1 and B2, it must be the case that either H or H prime fails to be a plausible candidate. Hence, contrary to what Winsberg claims, I would conclude that certainly uh, those two methods of detection would not count as a rid of us. So in a nutshell, my argument is the following. In light of the incompatibility between B1 and B2, there are only two possible epistemic states that for an agent to be in. And under neither of them, it, is it possible for an agent to find both an adequate target and rival hypothesis that does that satisfy <clears throat> all of Schubach's conditions of array diversity. They're the following. In case one, an agent believes that most one of these stimulations can be adequate, not by mere luck, for the purpose at hand, and hence H is not a plausible candidate for the target hypothesis, since for such an agent, the probability of H is zero. In case two, an agent believes that both simulations can be adequate, again, not by mere luck, and hence H prime, in this case, H prime is not an adequate rival hypothesis since for such a, an agent, the probability that H prime, uh, the probability of H prime is equal to zero. So let's consider case one first. An agent may reasonably believe that since different parameterizations for a particular process, in this case, cloud formation are competing ways, to represent such a process, then at most one of these simula simulations can be adequate not by mere luck for the purpose at hand. Hence, for an agent in this epistemic state, the probability of H is equal to zero, and hence H is not a plausible target hypothesis for them. Now, consider case two. Um, an agent may reasonably believe that although different parameterizations for process are competing ways to represent such a process, this, those differences are irrelevant for whether or not the simulations are adequate for the purpose at hand. According to such an agent, since the simulations are sufficiently similar in what they consider to be all the relevant risk aspects, um, it is possible to assume that both simulations can be adequate, not by mere luck, for the purpose at hand. Hence, for such an agent, H is a plausible target hypothesis. However, for an agent to believe that those differences are irrelevant for whether or not the simulations are adequate, not by mere luck, for the purpose at hand, they must effectively believe that the differences across the simulations are irrelevant to the results they will produce. In other words, such an agent must believe that both simulations, despite their differences, are bound to give the same result. Hence, according to such an agent, H prime is false and is thus not a plausible rival hypothesis. Now, there is a possible objection that is glaring and that I should respond to before concluding. My argument relies on the idea that if an investigator considers the hypothesis H to be plausible, then she must assign zero probability to the incompatible hypothesis H prime. But surely one might object. A Bayesian investigator could assign both H and the incompatible H prime some probability greater than zero. She can be uncertain about which is true. She collects more evidence precisely because she wants to discriminate between them. However, here's why I don't think this objection works. This objection 
relies on the idea that the investigator is uncertain about, the, about whether or not the differences across the models are irrelevant to the result they would produce. That is, according to the investigator, the models she considers might or might not give the same result. She simply isn't sure. But if a condition for it to be true and hence for all the models in the ensemble to be adequate representations of the target system, despite making incompatible assumptions about the target system, is that all the models in the ensemble will necessarily give the same result, whether or not it holds in the target system. So regardless of whether or not the investigator knows whether it's the case, this hypothesis must be part of the target hypothesis, H. Hence, the target hypothesis H must state something like the following. Are holes in the target system, and both climate simulations will necessarily give the same result, whether or not it holds in the target system. And both climate simulations are adequate, not by mere lack, representation of the target system. But notice that the above hypothesis can be equivalently rewritten as follows. Are holes in the target system, and the first simulation is adequate, not by mere lack, representation of the target system. And the second simulation will necessarily give the same result, R as the first simulation, whether or not R holds in the target system. But then notice that under H, the fact that the second simulation gives result R has nothing to do with whether or not R actually holds in the target system. Under H, the second simulation gives R merely because it is bound to give the same result as the first simulation, independently of whether R holds in the target system. Hence, H in this case is really an arbitrary conjunction of two hypotheses, H1 and H2, where H1 is a hypothesis that R holds, in the target system, and the first simulation is an adequate representation. And H2 is the hypothesis that the second simulation must give R independently of whether R holds in the target system, since the first simulation gives R. But then H1 is clearly relevant to the explanation of why the second simulation gives result R and hence cannot be confirmed by it. Hence, given that the ultimate aim is to confirm that R holds in the target system, H cannot be an adequate target hypothesis. Concluding, so, um, so okay, so in this talk, I've argued that um, the application of Schubach's account um, of area diversity in the context of model robustness is not at all as straightforward as you suggest, for it relies on substantial assumptions, assumptions which may be plausible in some cases, but certainly not in others. In particular, I've argued that when the hypothesis want to confirm is the result of a model is instantiated in the target system, and the models we select to check if the result is maintained, involve incompatible assumptions about the target system, Schubach's account uh, is inapplicable, for it is impossible to find both a target and rival hypothesis that satisfy all conditions of area diversity. Uh, this does not mean that it is impossible to defend the epistemic input of model-based robustness analysis. In this case, however, what I've argued is that any such defense cannot rely on Schubach's account. Indeed, I think the idea that there must be an explanation for the robustness of a result in order for this robustness to be epistemically significant is simply the wrong way to think about what is going on in these cases of robustness analysis. What matters in these cases is not why the models agree on a result, but rather that they do at all. For instance, as discussed earlier, there is a great deal of uncertainty about how to adequately represent the climate system. There are thus many ways one might attempt to do so. The hope then is that at least one of the available models is adequate for the purpose at hand, not necessarily all of them. Therefore, one way to motivate the idea that our confidence should increase the more models agree on a result is by arguing that by considering these additional models, we can increase our confidence that at least one of the selected models is adequate for the purpose at hand. This is a very different way of motivating the epistemic input of um, model-based robustness analysis. Notice further that it has very little, if anything, to do with the agent's knowledge and beliefs about the derivation of relationships in a pipeline of models. Unfortunately, however, although I think this is the right way to think about what's uh, going on in these cases of model-based robust analysis, this argument doesn't take us very far at all without an understanding of what is the space of possible adequate representations uh, of the target system in question and the extent to which the models we select are relevant for spanning that space. Uh, these are in many cases, very hard questions, questions that we philosophers should help with uh, if we want to help provide an adequate justification for the epistemic input of model robustness in those cases. Um, and indeed, I'll finish very soon, but I do think there is a lot of us, a lot for us philosophers to think about in relation to those questions. Uh, for instance, climate scientists have been trying for some time to find a measure of independence that can satisfactorily capture how dissimilar climate models are from one another. Although these attempts vary considerably, the implicit assumption motivating all of them is that the more dissimilar models are from other models in an ensemble, the greater the confidence we should have in the model's consensus. 
But why should we assume that the more dissimilar an ensemble is, the more it spans current scientific uncertainty? Um, for instance, two models may be rather similar in most respects and yet involve different parameterization schemes for highly uncertain processes. Although we might judge these models to be rather similar overall, they might span more scientific uncertainty about how to adequately represent the climate system than two models that we might judge less similar overall, but that do not involve different parameterization schemes for such highly uncertain processes. That is, considerations of dissimilarity across models do not on their own seem to be sufficient for assessing the extent to which an ensemble samples carry scientific identity. So what are the relevant considerations and which considerations can actually be implemented in practice? I believe these are the kind of questions that we philosophers should think about if we're generally interested in helping scientists evaluate the epistemic input of model-based robustness analysis. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>